story thirty one of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty one the temperance meeting at backley loud and long rang the single church bell at backley but its industry was entirely unnecessary for the single church at backley was already full from the altar to the doors and the window-sills and altar-steps were crowded with children the backleyites had been before to the regular yearly temperance meetings and knew too well the relative merits of sitting and standing to wait until called by the bell of course no one could afford to be absent for entertainments were entirely infrequent at backley the populace was too small to support a course of lectures and too moral to give any encouragement to circuses and minstrel troops but a temperance meeting was both moral and cheap and the children might all be taken without extra cost for months all the young men and maidens at backley had been practising the choruses of the songs which the temperance glee club at a neighbouring town was to sing at the meeting for weeks had large posters printed in the reddest of ink announced to the surrounding country that the parent society would send to backley for this special occasion one of its most brilliant orators and although the pastor made the statement in the smallest possible type that at the close of the entertainment a collection would be taken to defray expenses of the lecturer the sorrowing ones took comfort in the fact that certain fractional currency represented but a small amount of money the bell ceased ringing and the crowd at the door attempted to squeeze into the aisles the backley cornet quartet played a stirring air squire breet called the meeting to order and was himself elected permanent chairman the rev mr genial prayed earnestly that intemperance might cease to reign the glee club sang several songs with rousing choruses a pretended drunkard and a cold-water advocate both pupils of the backley high school delivered a dialogue in which the pretended drunkard was handled severely a tableau of the drunkard's home was given and then the parent society's brilliant orator took the platform the orator was certainly very well informed logical and convincing besides being quite witty he proved to the satisfaction of all present that alcohol was not nutritious that it awakened a general and unhealthy physical excitement and that it hardened the tissues of the brain he proved by reports of analyses that adulteration and with harmful materials was largely practised he quoted from reports of police prison and almshouse authorities to prove his statement that alcohol made most of our criminals he unrolled a formidable array of statistics and showed how many loaves of bread could be bought with the money expended in the united states for intoxicating liquors how many comfortable houses the same money would build how many schools it would support and how soon it would pay the national debt then he drew a moving picture of the sorrow of the drunkard's family and the awfulness of the drunkard's death and sat down amid a perfect thunder of applause the faithful beamed upon each other with glowing and expressive countenances the cornet quartet played don't you go tommy the smallest young lady sang father dear father come home with me now and then squire breet the chairman announced that the meeting was open for remarks a derisive laugh from some of the half-grown boys and a titter from some of the misses attracted the attention of the audience and looking round they saw joe digg standing up in a pew near the door put him out it's a shame disgraceful were some of the cries which were heard in the room mr digg is a citizen of backley said the chairman rapping vigorously to call the audience to order and though not a member of the association he is entitled to a hearing thank you mr chairman said joe digg when quiet was restored your words are the first respectful ones i've ever heard in backley and i do assure you i appreciate em but i want the audience to understand i ain't drunk i haven't had a cent for two days and nobody's treated me by this time the audience was very quiet but in a delicious fever of excitement a drunkard speaking right out in a temperance meeting they had never heard of such a thing in their lives 
verily backley was going to add one to the roll of modest villages made famous by unusual occurrences i s'pose mr chairman continued joe digg that the pint of temperance meetings is to stop drunkenness and as i'm about the only fully developed drunkard in town i'm most likely to know what this meetin's mounted to squire breed inclined his head slightly as if to admit the correctness of joe diggs's position i believe every word the gentleman has said continued the drunkard and here he paused long enough to let an excitable member exclaim bless the lord and burst into tears and he could have put it all a good deal stronger without stretching the truth and the sorrer of a drunkard's home can be talked about till the dictionary runs dry and then you don't know nothing about it but ain't none of you ever laughed about locking the stable door after the hoss is stolen that's just what this temperance meeting and all the others comes to a general and rather indignant murmur of dissent ran through the audience you don't believe it continued joe digg but i've been a drunkard and i'm one yet and you all got sense enough to understand that i ought to know best about it will the gentleman have the kindness to explain asked the lecturer i'm a-comin to it sir if my head'll see me through replied the drunkard you folks all believe that it love and liquor that makes men drink it now tain't no such thing i never had a chance to taste fancy drinks but i know that every kind of liquor i ever got a hold of was more like medicine than anything nice then what do they drink for demanded the excitable member i'll tell you said joe if you'll have a little patience i have to do it in my own way for i ain't used to public speaking you all know who i am my father was a church member and so was mother father done day's work for a dollar and a quarter a day how much firewood and clothes and food do you suppose that money could pay for we had to eat what come cheapest and when some of the women here was a sittin comfortable o nights a knittin and a sewin and a readin mother was hangin round the butcher shop tryin to beat the butcher down on the scraps that wasn't good enough for you folks soon as we young uns was big enough to do anything we was put to work i've worked for men in this room twelve and fourteen hours a day i don't blame em they didn't mean nothin out of the way they worked just as long themselves as did their boys but they allers had somethin inside to keep em up and i didn't does anybody wonder that when i harvested with some men that kept liquor in the field and found how it helped me along that i took it and thought twas a regular god's blessin and when i found twas a hurtin me how was i to go to work and give it up when it stood me instead of the eatables i didn't have and never had neither you should have prayed cried old deacon towser springing to his feet prayed long and earnest deacon said joe digg i've heard o your dyspepsia for nigh on to twenty years did prayin ever comfort your stomach the whole audience indulged in a profane laugh and the good deacon was suddenly hauled down by his wife the drunkard continued there's a lot of jest such folks here in beckley and everywheres else people that don't get half fed and do get worked half to death nobody means to abuse em but they do have a hard time of it and whiskey's the best friend they've got i work my men from sunrise to sunset in summer myself said deacon towser jumping up again and i'm the first man in the field and the last man to quit but i don't drink no liquor and my boys don't neither but you don't start in the morning with hungry little faces a hauntin you you don't take the dry crust to the field for your own dinner and leave the meat and butter at home for the wife and young uns and you go home without bein afeard to see a half-fed wife draggin herself round among a lot of puny young uns that don't know what's the matter with em jesus christ hisself broke down when it come to the cross deacon and poor human beings sometimes reaches a pint where they can't stand no more and when it's wife and children that brings it on it gets a man awful the gentleman is right i have no doubt said the chairman so far as a limited class is concerned but of course no such line of argument applies to the majority of cases there are plenty of well-fed healthy and lazy young men hanging about the tavern in this very village i know it said joe digg and i want to talk about them too i don't want to take up all the time of this meetin but you'll all allow i know more about that tavern than anybody else does there's lots of young men a hangin around it and why 
cause it's made pleasant for em and it's the only place in town that is i've been a faithful attendant at that tavern for nigh on to twenty years and i never knowed a hanger on there that had a comfortable home of his own some of em that don't have to go to bed a hungry have scoldin or squabblin parents and they can't go a visitin and hear fine music and see nice things of every sort to take their minds off as some young men in this beaten house can but the tavern is all as comfortable and there's generally somebody to sing a song and tell a joke and they commence goin there more for a pleasant time than for a drink at first there's lots of likely boys goin there that i wish to god would stay away and i've often felt like tellin em so but what's the use where are they to go to they ought to flee from even the appearance of evil said deacon towser but where be they to flee to deacon persisted joe digg would you like em to come a visit into your house they can come to the church meetings replied the deacon there's two in the week besides sundays and some of em's precious seasons all of em's an improvement on the wicked tavern ligion don't taste no better than whiskey till you get used to it said the drunkard horrifying all the orthodox people at backley and tain't made half so invitin tain't long ago i heerd you tellin another deacon that the church members ought to be ashamed of themselves cause scarcely any of em come to the week evenin meetins so you can't blame the boys at the tavern does the gentleman mean to convey the idea that all drunkards become so from justifying causes asked the lecturer no sir replied joe digg but i do mean to say that after you leave out them that takes liquor to help em do a full day's work and them that commence drinkin cause they're at the tavern and ain't got nowhere else to go you've made a mighty big hole in the crowd of drinkin men bigger and temperance meetings ever began to make it but how are they to be left out asked the lecturer by temperance folks doin somethin besides talkin replied the drunkard for twenty years i've been lectured and scolded and some good men's come to me with tears in their eyes and put their arms round my neck and beg me to stop drinking and i've wanted to and tried to but when all the encouragement a man gets is in words and no matter how he commence drinkin now every bone and muscle in him is a beggin for drink as soon as he leaves off and his mind's dull and he ain't fit for much and needs takin care of as particular as a mighty sick man talks just as good as wasted there's been times when if i'd been ahead on flour and meat and such i could a stopped drinkin but when a man's hungry and ragged and weak and half crazy knowin how his family's fixed and he can't do nothin for em and then don't get nothin but words to reform on he'll go back to the tavern every time and he'll drink till he's comfortable and till he forgets i want the people here one and all to understand that though i'm past helpin now there's been fifty times in the past twenty years when i might had been stopped short if anybody had been sensible enough and good-hearted enough to give me a lift joe digg sat down and there was a long pause the chairman whispered to the leader of the glee club and the club sang a song but somehow it failed to awaken the usual enthusiasm after the singing had ended the chairman himself took the floor and moved the appointment of a permanent committee to look after the intemperate and to collect funds when the use of money seemed necessary and the village doctor created a sensation by moving that mr joe digg should be a member of the committee deacon towser who was the richest man in the village and who dreaded subscription papers started an insidious opposition by eloquently vaunting the value of earnest prayer and of determined will in such cases but the new member of the committee though manifestly out of order outmanoeuvred the deacon by accepting both amendments and remarking that in a hard-fought fight folks would take all the help they could get somehow as soon as the new committee determining to open a place of entertainment in opposition to the tavern and furnish it pleasantly and make it an attractive gathering place for young men asked for contributions to enable them to do it the temperance excitement at backley abated marvellously but squire breet and the doctor and several other enterprising men took the entire burden on their own shoulders or pockets and joe digg was as useful as a reformed thief to a police department 
for the doctor whose professional education had left him a large portion of his natural common sense in working order took a practical interest in the old drunkard's case and others of the committee looked to the necessities of his family and it came to pass that joe was one of the earliest of the reformers men still go to the tavern at backley but as even when the twelve spake with inspired tongues some people remained impenitent the temperance men at backley feel that they have great cause for encouragement and that they have at least accomplished more within a few months than did all the temperance meetings ever held in their village End of story thirty one story thirty two of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty two jude gopher hill had determined that it could not endure jude any longer the inhabitants of gopher hill possessed an unusual amount of kindness and long-suffering as was proved by the fact that chinamen were allowed to work all abandoned claims at the hill had further proof been necessary it would have been afforded by the existence of a church directly beside the saloon although the frequenters of the sacred edifice had often during week evening meetings annoyed convivial souls in the saloon by requesting them to be less noisy but jude was too much for gopher hill no one molested him when he first appeared but each citizen entered a mental protest within his own individual consciousness for jude had a bad reputation in most of the settlements along spanish creek it was not that he had killed his man and stolen several horses and mules and got himself into a state of most disorderly inebriation for in the opinion of many gopher hillites these actions might have been the visible results of certain virtuous conditions of mind but jude had after killing a man spent the victim's money he had stolen from men who had befriended him he had jumped claims he had denied his score at the storekeepers he had lied on all possible occasions and had gambled away money which had been confided to him in trust one mining camp after another had become too hot for him but he never adopted a new set of principles when he staked a new claim so his stay in new localities was never of sufficient length to establish the fact of legal residence his name seemed to be a respectable cognomen of scriptural extraction but it was really a contraction of a name which while equally scriptural and far more famous was decidedly unpopular the name of judas iscariot the whole name had been originally bestowed upon jude in recognition of his success in swindling a mining partner but with an acuteness of perception worthy of emulation the miners determined that the length of the appellation detracted from its force so they shortened it to jude as a few of the more enterprising citizens of gopher hill were one morning discussing the desirableness of getting rid of jude and wondering how best to effect such a result they received important foreign aid a man rode up to the saloon dismounted and tacked on the wall a poster offering one thousand dollars reward for the apprehension of a certain person who had committed an atrocious murder a month before at duck run the names and aliases of the guilty person were unfamiliar to those who gathered about the poster but the description of the murderer's appearance was so suggestive that squire bogern one of the bystanders found jude and requested him to read the poster well twasn't me done it sulkily growled the namesake of the apostolic treasurer there ain't nobody in gopher that'd take a feller up for a reward replied the squire studiously oblivious of jude's denial but it's a nice mornin for a walk you can't miss the trail and get lost you know and seein you haven't staked any claim and so hain't got any to dispose of maybe yer could get inside of five minutes jude was accustomed to notices to quit and was able to extract their import from any verbiage whatever 
so he drank by and to himself and immediately sauntered out of town with an air of bravado in his carriage and a very lonesome look on his face down the trail he tramped past claims whose occupants knew him well enough but who just as he passed found some excuse for looking the other way he passed through one camp after another and discovered for he stopped at each saloon that the man on horseback had preceded him and that there seemed a wonderful unanimity of opinion as to the identity of the man who was wanted finally after passing through several of the small camps which were dotted along the trail a mile or two apart jude flung himself on the ground under a clump of azaleas with the air of a man whose temper had been somewhat ruffled i wonder he remarked after a discursive fitful but very spicy preface of ten minutes duration why they couldn't find something i had done instead of tucking some other fellow's job on me i have had difficulties but this here one's just one more than i knows on like nuff some galoot'll be mean nuff to try to git that thousand i'd try it myself if i was only somebody else wonder why i can't be decent like other fellers twon't pay to waste time thinkin about that though for i'll have to make a livin somehow jude indulged in a long sigh perhaps a penitential one and drew from his pocket a well-filled flask which he had purchased at the last saloon he had passed as he extracted it there came also from his pocket a copy of the poster which he had abstracted from a tree en route thar tis again he exclaimed angrily can't be satisfied showing itself everywhere but must come out of my pocket without being axed let's see perhaps i don't mean me after all one eye gone broken nose scar on right cheek powder marks on left stumpy beard sallow complexion hang-dog look i'd give a thousand if i had it to get the feller that writ that and yet it means me and no dodgin lord lord what did the old woman say if she was to see me nowadays he looked intently at the flask for a moment or two as if expecting an answer therefrom then he extracted the cork and took a generous drink but even the liquor failed to help him to a more cheerful view of the situation for he continued nobody knows me nobody says hello nobody asks me to name my bidders nobody even cusses me they let me stake a claim but nobody offers to lend me a pick or a shovel and nobody ever comes to the shanty to spend the evenin less it's a greenhorn curse em all i'll make some of em bleed for it i'll get their dust and go back east there's plenty of folks thar that'll be glad to see me if i've got the dust and maybe twould comfort the old woman some after all the trouble i've made her offer rewards for me do they i'll give em some reason to do it i ain't afeard of the whole state of californy and good lord what's that the gentleman who was not afraid of the whole state of california sprang hastily to his feet turned very pale and felt for his revolver for he heard rapid footsteps approaching by a little path in the bushes but though the footsteps seemed to come nearer and very rapidly he slowly took his hand from his pistol and changed his scared look for a puzzled one cryin reckon i ain't in danger from anybody that's bellerin but it's the fust time i've heard that kind of a noise in these spots must be a woman sounds like what i used to hear to home when i got on a tear tis a woman as he concluded there emerged from the path a woman who was neither very young nor very pretty but her face was full of pain and her eyes full of tears which signs of sorrow were augmented by a considerable scare as she suddenly found herself face to face with the unhandsome jude don't be afeard of me marm said jude as the woman retreated a step or two i'm durn sorry for you whatever's the matter i've got a wife to home and it makes me so sorry to hear her cry that i get blind drunk as quick as i can this tender statement seemed to reassure the woman for she looked inquiringly at jude and asked have you seen a man and woman go along with a young un nary replied jude young one lost yes exclaimed the woman commencing to cry again and a husband too i don't care much for him for he's a brute but johnny blessed little johnny oh oh and the poor woman sobbed pitifully 
jude looked uneasy and remembering his antidote for domestic tears extracted the bottle again he slowly put it back untasted however and exclaimed what does he look like marm the husband i mean i never wanted an excuse to put a hole through a feller as bad as i do this morning don't oh don't hurt him for god's sake cried the woman he ain't a good husband he's run off with another woman but but he's johnny's father yet if you could get johnny back he's the only comfort i ever had in the world the dear little fellow oh dear me and again she sobbed as if her heart was broken tell us about em where have they gone to what do they look like maybe i can get em for you said jude looking as if inclined to beat a retreat or do anything to get away from the sound of the woman's crying get him get johnny cried the woman falling on her knees and seizing jude's hand i can't give you anything for doing that but i'll pray for you as long as i've got breath that god may reward you i reckon said jude as he awkwardly disengaged his hand that prayin is what'll do me more good than anything else just now big feller is your husband and got any idee whar he is he is a big man replied the woman and he goes by the name of marksy in these parts and you'll find him at the widow beckles across the creek kill her if you like i hope somebody will but johnny johnny has got the loveliest brown eyes and the sweetest mouth that was ever made and oh, reckon i'll judge for myself interrupted jude starting off toward the creek and followed by the woman i know whar widder beckles is and and i've got enough stealin i guess to be able to grab a little boy without gettin catched spanish crick's pretty deep along here and the current runs heavy but the remainder of jude's sentence was left unspoken for just then he stepped into the creek and the chill of the snow-fed stream caused him to hold his breath remember you ain't to hurt him screamed the woman nor her either god forgive me but bring johnny bring johnny and god be with you the woman stood with clasped hands watching jude until he reached the opposite bank shook himself and disappeared and then she leaned against a tree and trembled and cried until she was startled by hearing someone say i beg pardon ma'am but have you seen any one pass the woman raised her head and saw a respectable severe-looking man in clothing rather neater than was common along spanish creek only one she replied and he's the best man livin he's gone to get johnny he won't be gone long your husband ma'am oh no sir i never saw him before one eye gone broken nose scar on the right cheek powder marks on the oh yes sir that's the man said the wondering woman perhaps you may not have seen this said the man handing her one of the posters describing jude then he uttered a shrill whistle the woman read the paper through and cried it's somebody else it must be no murderer would be so kind to a poor friendless woman oh god have i betrayed him don't take him sir it must be somebody else i wish i had money i would pay you more than the reward just to go away and let him alone madam replied the man beckoning to two men who were approaching i could not accept it nor will i accept the reward it is the price of blood but i am a minister of the gospel ma'am and in this godless generation it is my duty to see that the outraged dignity of the law is vindicated my associates i regret to say are actuated by different motives you just bet high on that exclaimed one of the two men who had approached a low-browed bestial ruffian half a thousand's more than i could pan out in a fortnight no matter how good luck i had parson he is a fool but we ain't no right to grumble about it seeing we get his share eh parley vous you speak truly mike replied his companion a rather handsome-looking frenchman of middle age and yet jinglerieur likes not the labour why not that he had lost his last ounce at monte and had the fever for play still in his blood not one sou would he earn in such ungentle a manner god's worst curses on all of you cried the woman with an energy which inspired her plain face and form with a terrible dignity and power if you lay a hand on a man who is the only friend a poor woman has ever found in the world glorieur shuddered and mike receded a step or two but the ex-minister maintained the most perfect composure and exclaimed 
poor fools it is written the curse causeless shall not fall and yet madam i assure you that i most tenderly sympathize with you in your misfortunes whatever they may be then let him alone cried the woman my only child has been stolen away from me dear little johnny and the man offered to go get him and you've made me betray him oh god curse you all madam replied the still imperturbable parson the crime of blood guiltiness cannot be imputed to you for you did not know what you were doing the woman leaned against a tree and waited until glorieux declared to the parson he would abandon the chase it is useless said he striking a dramatic attitude and pointing to the woman for her tears have quenched the fiery fever in the blood of glorieux then i'll get the whole thousand growled mike and i'll need it too if i've got to stand this sort of thing much longer a confused sound of voices on the other side of the creek attracted the attention of the men and caused the woman to raise her head a moment later jude appeared with a child in his arms and plunged into the water now we'll have him cried the parson and you madam will have your child be ready to chase him in if he attempts to run when he gets ashore go back go back screamed the woman they are after you these men try to the law-abiding parson placed his hand over the woman's mouth but found himself promptly flying backward through space while mike roared touch a woman will you no thousand dollars nor any other money'll hire me to travel with such a scoundrel catch him yourself if you want to but if you do said glorier politely as he drew his revolver it will be necessary for glorier to slay the lord's anointed follered by thunder said mike it was true during the few seconds which had been consumed in conversation jude got well into the creek he had not seemed to hear the woman's warning but now a greater danger threatened him for on the opposite bank of the creek there appeared a man who commenced firing at jude's head and the small portion of his shoulders that was visible the monster oh the wretch screamed the woman he may hit johnny his only son oh god have mercy on me and save my child a shot immediately behind her followed the woman's prayer and glorier exclaimed pointing to the opposite bank where marxy was staggering and falling glorier gathered from your words that a divorce would be acceptable madam uh, behold you have it pity nobody didn't think of it sooner observed mike shading his eyes as he stared intently at jude for there's a red streak in the water right behind him the woman was already standing at the water's edge with hands clasped in an agony of terror and anxiety the three men hastened to join her wish i could swim said mike for he's getting weak and needs help the parson sprang into the water and in spite of the chill and the swift current he was soon by jude's side take the young un gasped jude for i'm a goner put your hand on my shoulder said the parson i can get you both ashore tain't no use said jude feebly corpses don't count for much in californy but your immortal part remonstrated the parson trying to seize jude by the hand which held little johnny god of mercy on it whispered the dying man it's the first time you ever had an excuse to do it strong man and expert swimmer as the ex-minister was he was compelled to relinquish his hold of the wounded man and jude after one or two fitful struggles against his fate drifted lifeless down the stream and into eternity while the widowed mother regained her child the man of god the chivalrous frenchman and the brutish mike slowly returned to their camp but no one who met them could imagine from their looks that they were either of them any better than fugitives from justice. End of story 32story thirty three of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty three a love of a cottage we had been married about six months and were boarding in the most comfortable style imaginable when one evening after dinner sophronia announced that her heart was set upon keeping house 
my heart sank within me but one of the lessons learned within my half year of married life is that when sophronia's heart is set upon anything the protests i see fit to make must be uttered only within the secret recesses of my own consciousness then sophronia remarked that she had made up her mind to keep house in the country at which information my heart sank still lower not that i lack appreciation of natural surroundings i delight in localities where beautiful scenery exists and where tired men can rest under trees without even being suspected of inebriety but when any of my friends go house hunting in the city in the two or three square miles which contain all the desirable houses their search generally occupies a month during which time the searchers grow thin nervous absent-minded and uncompanionable what then would it be my fate after searching the several hundred square miles of territory which were within twenty miles of new york but sophronia had decided that it was to be and i mine not to make reply mine not to reason why mine but to do or die by a merciful dispensation of providence however i was saved from the full measure of the fate i feared sophronia has a highly imaginative nature in her a fancy naturally ethereal has been made supersensitive by long companionship of tender-voiced poets and romancers so when i bought a railway guide and read over the names of stations within a reasonable distance of new york sophronia's interest was excited in exact proportion to the attractiveness of the names themselves communion paw she pronounced execrable ewanville reminded her of a dreadful psalm tune patterson recalled the vulgar question who struck billy patterson yonkers sounded dutch morristown had a plebeian air rutherford park well that sounded endurable it reminded her of the scene in mrs somebody's novel elizabeth was a dreadfully old-fashioned name villa valley stop exclaimed sophronia raising impressively the hand which bore her diamond engagement ring that is the place pierre i was christened peter but miss sophronia never looked encouragingly upon me until a friend nicknamed me pierre i have a presentiment that our home will be at villa valley how melodious how absolutely enchanting it sounds there is always a lake or a brook in a valley too don't you know i did not previously possess this exact knowledge of the peculiarity of valleys but i have an accurate knowledge of what my duty is regarding any statement which sophronia may make so i promptly assented by the rarest good fortune i found in the morning paper an advertisement of a real estate agent who made a specialty of villa valley property this agent when visited by me early in the morning abundantly confirmed sophronia's intuition regarding brooks and lakes by asserting that his charming town possessed both beside many other attractions which irresistibly drove us to villa valley the next day with a letter to the agent's resident partner it was a bright april morning when we started in the resident agent's carriage to visit a number of houses the rent of which did not exceed four hundred dollars drive first to the old stone cottage said sophronia the very name is enchanting the house itself did not support sophronia's impression it stood very near the road was a quarter of a mile from any tree or bush had three large and three small rooms only one of which could be reached without passing through two others for the house had no hall the woodwork would have apparently greeted paint as a lifelong stranger the doors in size and clumsiness reminded me of the gates of gaza as pictured in sunday school books the agent said it had once been washington's headquarters and i saw no reason to doubt his word though i timidly asked whether tradition asserted that the father of his country had not suffered a twinge of neuralgia while at villa valley a perfect snuggery did not belie its name but in size and ventilation forcibly suggested a chicken coop charming swiss cottage seemed to be a remodelled pigsty from which objectionable matter had not been removed 
the house in the woods was approachable only through water halfway up the carriage body so we regretfully abandoned pursuit of it silver lake exclaimed sophronia reading the memoranda she had penciled from the agent's descriptive list that i am sure will suit us don't you remember pierre my presentiment about a lake at villa valley i remembered by a little stretch of my imagination but alas for the uncertainty even of the presentiments of one of nature's most impressionable children the lake was a pond perhaps twenty feet in diameter an antiquated boot two or three abandoned milk cans and a dead cat reposed upon its placid beach and from a sheltered nook upon its southerly side an early aroused frog appeared inquiringly and uttered a cry of surprise or perhaps of warning take me away exclaimed sophronia it was a dream a fateful dream new cottage with all modern improvements seemed really to justify its title but sophronia declined to look farther than its outside i could never be happy in that house pierre said she with emphasis it looks to be entirely new tis madam declared the agent the last coat of paint hasn't been on a month so i divined replied sophronia and so it is simply a lifeless mass of boards and plaster no loving heart-throbs ever consecrated its walls no tender romances have been woven under its eaves no wistful yearnings no agonies of parting have made its chambers instinct with life no i declare exclaimed the agent excuse me for interrupting ma'am but i believe i've got the very house you're looking for how would you like a rambling old family homestead a hundred years old with quaint wide fireplaces high mantels overhanging eaves a heavy screen of evergreens vines clambering over everything a great wide hall exquisite charming enchanting paradisical divine murmured sophronia and the rent is only three hundred dollars continued the agent this latter bit of information aroused my strongest sentiment and i begged the agent to show us the house at once the approach was certainly delightful we dashed into the gloom of a mass of spruces pines and arbor vitaes and stopped suddenly in front of a little low cottage which consisted principally of additions no one of which was after any particular architectural order sophronia gazed an instant her face assumed an ecstatic expression which i had not seen since the day of our engagement she threw her arms about my neck her head drooped upon my bosom and she whispered my ideal then this matchless woman intuitively realizing that the moment for action had arrived reassumed her natural dignity and with the air of mrs scott siddons in elizabeth exclaimed enough we take it hadn't you better examine the interior first my love i suggested were the interior only that of a barn remarked my consistent mate my decision would not be affected thereby the eternal unities are never disunited nor are i don't believe i've got the key with me said the agent but perhaps we can get in through one of the windows the agent tied his horse and disappeared behind the house again sophronia's arm encircled me and she murmured oh pierre what bliss it's a good way from the station pet i ventured to remark sophronia's enthusiasm gave place to scorn she withdrew her affectionate demonstration and replied spoken like a real man the practical always the ideal never once i dreamed of the companionship of a congenial spirit but alas a good way from the station were i a man i would to reside in such a bower plod cheerfully over miles of prosaic clods and you'd get your shapely boots most shockingly muddy i thought as the agent opened one of the front windows and invited us to enter french windows too exclaimed sophronia oh pierre and see that exquisite old mantel it looks as if it had been carved from ebony upon the banks of one of the queen of the adriatic's noiseless byways and these tiny rooms how cosy how like fairyland again i declare we will take it let us return at once to the city 
how i loathe the thought of treading its noisy thoroughfares again and order our carpets and furniture are you sure you won't be lonesome here darling i asked it is quite a distance from any neighbours a true woman is never lonesome when she can commune with nature replied sophronia besides she continued in a less exalted strain i shall have laura stanley and stella sykes with me most of the time the agent drove us back to his office spending not more than ten minutes on the road yet the time sufficed sophronia to give me in detail her idea of the combination of carpets shades furniture pictures etc which would be in harmony with our coming domicile suddenly nature reasserted her claims and sophronia addressed the agent your partner told my husband that there were a lake and two brooks at villa valley i should like to see them certainly ma'am replied the agent promptly i'll drive you past them as you go to the train ten minutes later the lease was made out and signed i was moved to interrupt the agent with occasional questions such as uh, isn't the house damp any mosquitoes is the water good and plentiful does the cellar extend under the whole house but the coldly practical nature of these queries affected sophronia's spirits so unpleasantly that out of pure affection i forbore then the agent invited us into his carriage again and said he would drive us to the lower depot two stations i inquired yes said he and one's as near to your house as the other your house whispered sophronia turning her soulful eyes full upon me and inserting her delicate elbow with unnecessary force between my not heavily covered ribs your house oh pierre does not the dignity of having a house appear to you like a beautiful vision i strove for an instant to frame a reply in keeping with sophronia's mental condition when an unpleasant odour saluted my nose that sophronia was conscious of the same disgusting atmospheric feature i learned by the sound of a decided sniff looking about us i saw a large paper mill beside a stream whose contents looked sewer-like smell the paper mash boiling asked the agent peculiar isn't it very healthy though they say on the opposite side of the road trickled a small gutter full of a reddish-brown liquid its source seeming to be a dye-house behind us just then we drove upon a bridge which crossed a vile pool upon the shore of which was a rolling mill here's the lake said the agent delwood lake they call it and here's the brooks emptying into it one on each side of the road sophronia gasped and looked solemn her thoughtfulness lasted but a moment however then she applied her daintily perfumed handkerchief to her nose and whispered dell well but sharp big david bear don't you think so during the fortnight which followed sophronia and i visited house furnishing stores carpet dealers furniture warehouses picture stores and bric-a-brac shops the agent was very kind he sent a boy to the house with the keys every time the express wished to deliver any of our goods finally the carpet dealer having reported the carpets laid sophronia i and our newly engaged servant started by rail to villa valley three double truck loads of furniture preceding us by way of the turnpike i had thoughtfully ordered quite a quantity of provisions put into the house in advance of our arrival hiring a carriage at the station and obtaining the keys of the agent we drove to our residence sophronia to use her own expression felt as she imagined juno did when first installed as mistress of the rosy summit of the divine mount while i though scarcely in a mood to compare myself with jove was conscious of a new and delightful sense of manliness the shades and curtains were in the windows the sun shone warmly upon them and a bright welcome seemed to extend itself from the whole face of the cottage i unlocked the door and tenderly kissed my darling under the lintel then we stepped into the parlour sophronia immediately exclaimed gracious the word that escaped my lips i shrink from placing upon the printed page 
a barrel of flour one of sugar another of corned beef and a half barrel of molasses a box of candles a can of kerosene oil some cases of canned fruits a box of laundry soap three wash-tubs and a firkin of butter all these and many other packages covered the parlour floor and sent up a smell suggestive of an unventilated grocery the flour had sifted between the staves of the barrel the molasses had dripped somewhat the box of soap had broken open and a single bar had been fastened to the carpet by the seal of a boot heel of heroic size sophronia stepped into little pools of molasses and the effect seemed to be that the carpet rose to bestow sweet clinging kisses upon the dainty feet of the loveliest of her sex horrible ejaculated sophronia and here come the trucks said i looking out of the window and the one with the parlour furniture is in front fortunately the truckmen were good-tempered and amenable to reason expressed by means of currency so we soon had the provisions moved into the kitchen then the senior truckman kindly consented to dispose of an old tarpaulin at about twice the price of a piece of velvet carpet of similar size and this we spread upon the parlour floor while the furniture should be brought in sophronia assumed the direction of proceedings but it soon became evident that she was troubled the room evidently was not arranged for this furniture said she and she spoke truthfully we had purchased a lounge a large centre table an etagere a turkish chair two reception chairs four chairs to match the lounge a rocker or two an elegant fire screen and several other articles of furniture and there was considerable difficulty experienced not only in arranging them but in getting them into the parlour at all finally the senior truckman spoke the only way to get everything in is to fix em the way we do at store set em close together he spoke truly and sophronia with a sigh assented to such an arrangement suggesting that we could rearrange the furniture afterward and stipulating only that the lounge should be placed in the front of the room this done there were three and a half feet of space between the front of the lounge and the inside of the window casings we can at least sit upon it and lose our souls in the dying glories of the sun upon the eternal hills and a oh, gracious pierre where's the piano to go sure enough and the piano was already at the door the senior truckman cast his professional eye at the vacant space and spoke oh, you can put it right there said he there won't be no room for the stool to go behind it but if you put the keyboard to the front and open the window you can stand outdoors and play sophronia eyed the senior truckman suspiciously for a moment but not one of his honest facial muscles moved so sophronia exclaimed true and uh, how romantic while the piano was being placed i became conscious of some shocking language being used on the stairway looking out i saw two truckmen and the headboard of our new bedstead inextricably mixed on the stairs why don't you go on i asked the look which one of the truckmen gave me i shall not forget until my dying day the man's companion remarked that when uh, qualified fools bought furniture for such doubly qualified houses they ought to have brains enough to get things small enough to get up the trebly qualified stairs i could not deny the logic of this statement impious as were the qualifying adjectives which were used thereupon but something had to be done we could not put the bedstead together upon the stairway and sleep upon it there even were there not other articles of furniture imperatively demanding a right of way try to get it down again said i they tried and after one mighty effort succeeded they also brought down several square yards of ceiling plaster and the entire handrail of the stair think the ceilings of these rooms is high enough to let that bed stand up asked the senior truckman i hastily measured the height of the ceilings and then of the bedstead and found the latter nearly eighteen inches too high then i called sophronia 
the bedstead was of her selection and was an elegant sample of fine woods and excessive ornamentation it was a precious bit of furniture but time was precious too the senior truckman suggested that the height of the bedstead might be reduced about two feet by the removal of the most lofty ornament and that a healthy man could knock it off with his fist Oh, let it be done said sophronia what matter a king discrowned is still a king at heart the senior truckman aimed a deadly blow with a cart rung and the bedstead filled its appointed place the remaining furniture followed as fast as could be expected we soon gave up the idea of getting it all into the house but the wood house was spacious and easy of access so we stowed there important portions of three chamber sets a gem of a sideboard the turkish chair which had been ordered for the parlour and the hat-rack which the hall was too small to hold we also deposited in the wood-house all the pictures in their original packages at length the trucks were emptied the senior truckman smiled sweetly as i passed a small fee into his hand then he looked thoughtfully at the roof of the cottage and remarked it's none of my business i know but i hate to see nice things spiled i'd watch that roof if i was you the first time it rained i thanked him he drove off i turned and accepted the invitation which was presented by sophronia's outstretched arms oh pierre she exclaimed at last we are in our own home no uncongenial spirits about us no one to molest or annoy no unsympathetic souls to stifle our ardent passion for nature and the work of her free divine hands a frowsy head suddenly appeared at the dining-room door and a voice which accompanied it remarked didn't they bring any stove ma'am sophronia looked inquiringly at me and i answered no looking very blank at the same time then how am i to make a fire to cook with asked the girl in the range of course said sophronia our domestic's next remark had at least the effect of teaching what was her nationality and do you think i'd ask for a stove at here was a range in the house divil a bit never mind dear said i soothingly i'm an old soldier i'll make a fire out of doors and give you as nice a cup of tea and a plate of hot biscuit as you ever tasted and i'll order a stove the first thing in the morning sophronia consented and our domestic was appeased then i asked the domestic to get some water while i should make the fire the honest daughter of toil was absent for many moments and when she returned it was to report with some excitement that there was neither well nor cistern on the premises then i grew angry and remarked in sophronia's hearing that we were a couple of fools to take a house without first proving whether the agent had told the truth but sophronia who is a consistent optimist rebuked me for my want of faith in the agent pierre said she it is unmanly to charge a fellow-man with falsehood upon the word of a menial i know that agent tells the truth for he has such liquid blue eyes besides his house is right next to the presbyterian church either one of these powerful arguments was sufficient to silence me of course so i took the pail and sought well and cistern myself but if either was on the place it was so skilfully secreted that i could not find the slightest outward evidence of it finally to be thorough i paced the garden from front to rear over lines not more than ten feet apart and then scrutinized the fence corners while at this work i was approached by a gentleman who seemed to come from a house two or three hundred yards off moved into the cottage it seems says he yes i replied do you know the place the agent said there was excellent water here but i can't find it he meant there was good water in my well where all occupants of the cottage have drawn water for several years the well belonging to your place was covered up when the road was cut through a few years ago and neighbor hubble well i don't say anything against him neighbors must be neighborly but folks do say he's too stingy to dig a new well that's the reason the cottage hasn't been occupied much for the last few years but everybody is welcome to draw from my well come along 
i followed the kind-hearted man but i wished that the liquid depth of the agent's blue eyes had a proper parallel upon the estate which he had imposed upon me i returned as full of wrath as my pail was of water when across the fence i saw sophronia's face so suffused with tender exultation that admiration speedily banished ill-nature but it was for a brief moment only for sophronia's finely cut lips parted and their owner exclaimed oh pierre what a charming pastoral picture you and the pail and the lawn as a background i wish we might always have to get water from our neighbour's well we retired early and in the delightful quiet of our rural retreat with the moon streaming through our chamber window sophronia became poetic and i grew too peaceful and happy even to harbour malice against the agent the eastern sun found its way through the hemlocks to wake us in the morning and the effect was so delightfully different from the rising bell of the boarding-house that when sophronia indulged in some freedom with certain of whittier's lines and exclaimed sad is the man who never sees the sun shine through his hemlock trees i appreciated her sentiment and expressed my regard in a loving kiss again i made a fire out of doors boiled coffee fried ham and eggs made some biscuit begged some milk of our neighbour and then we had a delightful little breakfast then i started for the station don't forget the stove dear said sophronia as she gave me a parting kiss and be sure to send a butcher and baker and grocer and just then our domestic appeared and remarked ere you may as well got another girl the like o' me ain't going to bring water from half a mile away sophronia grew pale but she lost not an atom of her saintly calmness she only said half to herself poor thing she hasn't a bit of poetry in her soul when i returned in the evening i found sophronia in tears the stove-men had not quite completed their work so sophronia and her assistant had eaten nothing but dry bread since breakfast the girl interrupted us to say that the stove was ready but that she couldn't get either coal or wood and would i just come and see why i descended five of the cellar stairs but the others were covered with water and upon the watery expanse about me floated the wagon-load of wood i had purchased the coal heap under a window fifteen feet away loomed up like a rugged crag of basaltic rock i took soundings with a stick and found the water was rather more than two feet deep fortunately there were among my war relics a pair of boots as long as the legs of their owner so i drew these on and descended the stairs with shovel and coal scuttle the boots had not been oiled in ten years so they found accommodation for several quarts of water as i strode angrily into the kitchen and set the scuttle down with a suddenness which shook the floor sophronia clapped her hands in ecstasy pierre she exclaimed you look like the picture of the sturdy retainers of the old english barons oh i do hope that water won't go away very soon the rattling of the water in your boots makes your steps so impressive i found that in spite of the hunger from which she had suffered sophronia had not been idle during the day she had coaxed the baker's man to open the cases of pictures and she and the domestic had carried each picture to the room in which it was to hang the highest ceiling in the house was six and a half feet from the floor whereas our smallest picture measured three feet and a half in height but sophronia's art-loving soul was not to be daunted the pictures being too large to hang she had leaned them against the walls it's such an original idea said she and then too it gives each picture such an unusual effect don't you think so i certainly did we spent the evening in trying to make our rooms look less like furniture warehouses but succeeded only partly we agreed too that we could find something for painters and calciminers to do for the ceilings and walls were blotched and streaked so much that our pretty furniture and carpets only made the plastering look more dingy but when again we retired and our lights were put 
and only soft moonbeams relieved the darkness our satisfaction with our new house filled us with pleasant dreams which we exchanged before sleeping after falling asleep i dreamed of hearing a wonderful symphony performed by an unseen orchestra it seemed as if liszt might have composed it and as if the score were particularly strong in trombones and drums then the scene changed and i was on a ship in a storm at sea the gale was blowing my hair about and huge raindrops occasionally struck my face sophronia was by my side but instead of glorying with me in meeting the storm king in his home she complained bitterly of the rain the unaccountable absence of her constitutional romanticism provoked me and i remonstrated so earnestly that the effort aroused me to wakefulness but sophronia's complaining continued i had scarcely realized that i was in a cottage chamber instead of on a ship's deck when sophronia exclaimed pierre i wonder if a shower bath hasn't been arranged just where our bed stands because drops of water are falling in my face once in a while they are lovely and cool but they trickle off on the pillow and that don't feel nice i lit a candle and examined the ceiling directly over sophronia's head there was a heavy blotch from the centre of which the water was dropping another result of taking that liquid blue-eyed agent's word i growled hastily moving the bed and its occupant and setting the basin on the floor to catch the water and save the carpet why pierre exclaimed sophronia as i blew out the light how unjust you are who could expect an agent to go over the roof like a cat and examine each shingle gracious it's dropping here too again i lighted the candle and moved the bed but before i had time to retire sophronia complained that a stream was trickling down upon her feet the third time the bed was moved water dropped down upon my pillow and the room was too small to relocate the bed so that none of these unauthorized hydrants should moisten us then we tried our spare chamber but that was equally damp suddenly i bethought myself of another war relic and hurrying to an old trunk extracted an india-rubber blanket this if we kept very close together kept the water out but almost smothered us we changed our positions by sitting up back to back and dropping the rubber blanket over our heads by this arrangement the air was allowed to circulate freely and we had some possibilities of conversation left us but the effect of the weight of the blanket resting largely upon our respective noses was somewhat depressing suddenly sophronia remarked oh pierre this reminds me of those stories you used to tell me of how you and all your earthly treasures used to hide under this blanket from the rain the remark afforded an opportunity for a very graceful reply but four hours elapsed before i saw it sophronia did not seem hurt by my negligence but almost instantly continued it would be just like war if there was only some shooting going on can't you fire your revolver out of the window pierre i could i replied if that blue-eyed agent was anywhere within range why pierre i think you're dreadfully unjust to that poor man he can't go sleeping around in all the rooms of each of his cottages every time there's a rainstorm to see if they leak besides oh pierre i've a brilliant idea it can't be wet downstairs true i was so engrossed by different plans of revenge that i had not thought of going into the parlour or dining-room to sleep we moved to the parlour sophronia took the lounge while i found the floor a little harder than i supposed an ex-soldier could ever find any plain surface it did not take me long however to learn that the parlour floor was not a plain surface it contained a great many small elevations which kept me awake for the remainder of the night wondering what they could be at early dawn i was as far from a satisfactory theory as ever and i hastily loosened one end of the carpet and looked under the protuberances were knots in the flooring boards in the days when the sturdy patriots of new jersey despised such monarchical luxuries as carpets the soft portions of these boards had been slowly worn away but the knots every one has heard the expression as tough as a pine knot 
fortunately we had indulged in a frightfully expensive rug and upon this i sought and found a brief period of repose and forgetfulness while we were at the breakfast-table our girl appeared with red eyes and a hoarse voice and remarked that now she must leave she had learned to like us and she loved the country but she had an aged parent whose sole support she was and could not afford to risk her life in such a house let her go said sophronia if variety is a spice of life why shouldn't the rule apply to servants perhaps it does my dear i replied but if we have to pay each girl a month's wages for two or three days of work the spice will be more costly than enjoyable huh immediately after breakfast i sought the agent i supposed he would meet me with downcast eyes and averted head but he did nothing of the kind he extended his hand cordially and said he was delighted to see me that roof said i getting promptly to business leaks well it's simply a sieve and you told me the house was dry so the owner told me sir of course you can't expect us to inspect the hundreds of houses we handle in a year well however that may be the owner is mistaken and he must repair the roof at once the agent looked thoughtful if you had wished the landlord to make necessary repairs you should have so stipulated in the lease the lease you have signed provides that all repairs shall be made at your own expense did the landlord draw up the lease i asked fixing my eye severely upon the agent's liquid orbs but the agent met my gaze with defiance and an expression of injured dignity i asked you whether you would have the usual form of lease said the agent and you replied certainly i abruptly left the agent's presence went to a lumber yard near by and asked where i could find the best carpenter in town he happened to be on the ground purchasing some lumber and to him i made known my troubles and begged him to hasten to my relief the carpenter was a man of great decision of character and he replied promptly ciphering on a card in the meantime no you don't every carpenter in town has tried his hand on that roof and made it worse than before the only way to make it tight is to re-shingle it all over that'll cost you sixty-seven dollars and fifty cents unless the scantling is too rotten to hold the nails in which case the job will cost you eighteen dollars and seventy-five cents more i guess the rafters are strong enough to hold together a year or two longer i made some excuse to escape the carpenter and his dreadful figures and he graciously accepted it doubtless the perfect method in which he did it was the result of frequent interviews with other wretched beings who had leased the miserable house which i had taken into my confidence i determined to plead with the landlord whose name i knew and i asked a chance acquaintance on the train if he knew where i could find the proprietor of my house oh certainly said he there he is in the opposite seat but one reading a religious weekly i looked and my heart sank within me and my body sank into a seat a cold-eyed hatchet-faced man from whom not even the most eloquent beggar could hope to coax a penny of what use would it be to try to persuade him to spend sixty-seven dollars and fifty cents on something which i had agreed to take care of something had to be done however so i wasted most of the day in consulting new york roofers the conclusion of the whole matter was that i spent about thirty dollars for condemned flies from hospital tents and had these drawn tightly over the roof when this was done the appearance of the house was such that i longed for an incendiary who would compel me to seek a new residence but when sophronia gazed upon the roof she clapped her hands joyfully and exclaimed pierre it will be almost as nice as living in a tent to have one on the roof it looks just the same you know until your eyes get down to the edge of it there was at least one comfort in living at villa valley the people were very intelligent and sociable and we soon made many pleasant acquaintances but they all had something dreadful to suggest about our house a doctor who was a remarkably fine fellow said he would be glad of my patronage and didn't doubt that he would soon have it unless i had the cellar pumped out at once 
then mrs blath the leader of society in the village told my wife how a couple who once lived in our cottage always had chills though no one else at villa valley had the remotest idea of what a chill was the several coal dealers in the village competed in the most lively manner for our custom and when i mentioned the matter in some surprise to my grocer he remarked that they knew what houses needed most coal to keep them warm the year through and worked for custom accordingly a deacon who was sociable but solemn remarked that some of his most sweetly mournful associations clustered about our cottage he had followed several of its occupants to their long homes and yet as the season advanced and the air was too dry to admit of dampness anywhere and the summer breezes blew in the windows and doors whole clouds of perfume from the rank thickets of old-fashioned roses which stood about the garden we became sincerely attached to the little cottage then heavy masses of honeysuckles and vines which were trained against the house grew dense and picturesque with foliage and sophronia would enjoy hours of perfect ecstasy sitting in an easy chair under the evergreens and gazing at the graceful outlines of the house and its verdant ornaments but the cellar was obdurate it was pumped dry several times but no pump could reach the inequalities in its floor and in august there came a crowd of mosquitoes from the water in these small holes they covered the ceilings and walls they sat in every chair they sang accompaniments to all of sophronia's songs they breakfasted dined and supped with us and upon us sophronia began to resemble a person in the first stages of varioloid yet that incomparable woman would sit between sunset and dusk looking through nearly closed eyes at the walls and ceiling and would remark pierre when you look at the walls in this way the mosquitoes give them the effect of being papered with some of that exquisite new japanese wallpaper with its quaint spots don't you think so finally september came and with it the equinoctial storm we lay in bed one night the wind blowing about us and sophronia rhapsodizing through the medium of longfellow's lines about the storm wind of the equinox when we heard a terrific crash and then the sound of a falling body which shook the whole house sophronia clasped me wildly and began to pray but i speedily disengaged myself lighted a candle and sought the cause of our disturbance i found it upon the hall floor it was the front door and its entire casing both of which with considerable plaster lathing and rotten wood had been torn from its place by the fury of the storm in the morning i sought a printer with a small but strong manuscript which i had spent the small hours of the night in preparing it bore this title the house i live in the printer gave me the proof the same day and i showed it to the owner of the house the same evening remarking that i should mail a copy to every resident of villa valley and have one deposited in every post office box in new york city the owner offered to cancel my lease if i would give up my unkind intention and i consented then we hired a new cottage not from the agent with the liquid blue eyes and before accepting it i examined it as if it were to be my residence to all eternity and yet when all our household goods were removed and sophronia and i took our final departure the gentle mistress of my home turned regretfully burst into tears and sobbed oh pierre in spite of everything it is a love of a cottage end of story thirty three story thirty four of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirty four the blayton rivals the village of blayton contained as many affectionate young people as any other place of its size and was not without young ladies for the possession of whose hearts two or more young men strove against each other when however allusion was ever made to the rivals no one doubted to whom the reference applied 
it was always understood that the young men mentioned were those two of miss florence elserly's admirers for whom miss elserly herself seemed to have more regard than she manifested toward any one else there has always been some disagreement among the young ladies of blayton as to miss elserly's exact rank among beauties but there was no possibility of doubt that miss elserly attracted more attention than any other lady in the town and that among her admirers had been every young man among whom other blayton ladies of taste would have chosen their life partners had the power of choosing pertained to their own sex the good young men of the village the successful business men who were bachelors and the stylish young fellows who came from the neighbouring city in the summer bowed before miss elserly as naturally as if fate embodied in the person of the lady herself commanded them how many proposals miss elserly had received no one knew for two or three years no one was able to substantiate an opinion from the young lady's walk and conversation that she specially preferred any one of her personal acquaintances but at length it became evident that she evinced more than the interest of mere acquaintanceship in hubert brown the best of the native-born young men of the village mr brown was a theological student but the march of civilization had been such at blayton that a prospective shepherd of souls might listen to one of beethoven's symphonies in a city opera house without having any sin imputed unto him such music-loving inhabitants of blayton as listened to one of these symphonies which was also heard by mr brown and miss elserly noticed that when the young couple exchanged words and glances miss elserly's well-trained features were not so carefully guarded as they usually were in society such ladies as had nothing to do and even a few who were not without pressing demands upon their time canvassed the probabilities of the match quite exhaustively and made some prophecies but were soon confused by the undoubted fact that miss elserly drove out a great deal with major mailing the dashing ex-soldier and successful broker from the city the charm of uncertainty being thus added to the ordinary features of interest which pertain to all persons suspected of being in love made miss elserly's affairs of unusual importance to every one who knew the young lady even by sight and for three whole months the rivals were a subject of conversation next in order to the weather at length there came a day when the case seemed decided for three days hubert brown's face was very seldom seen on the street and when seen it was longer and more solemn than was required even by that order of sanctity in which theological students desire to live then it was noticed that while miss elserly's beauty grew no less in degree it changed in kind that she was more than ever seen in the society of the handsome broker and that the broker's attentions were assiduous then it was suspected that mr brown had proposed and been rejected ladies who owed calls to mr brown's mother made haste to pay them and as rewards of merit brought away confirmation of the report then before the gossips had reported the probable engagement of miss elserly to major mailing the lady and major made the announcement themselves to their intimate friends and the news quickly reached every one who cared to hear it a few weeks later however there circulated very rapidly a story whose foreshadowing could not have been justly expected of the village gossips the major absented himself for a day or two from his boarding-house and at a time too when numerous gentlemen from the city came to call upon him some of these callers returned hurriedly to the city evincing by words and looks the liveliest disappointment while two of them after considerable private conversation with the proprietress of the house and after displaying some papers in the presence of a local justice of the peace to whom the good old lady sent in her perplexity took possession of the major's room and made quite free with the ex-warriors cigars liquors and private papers 
then the city newspapers told how mr mailing a broker of excellent ability and reputation as well as one of the most gallant of his country's defenders in her hour of need had been unable to meet his engagements and had also failed to restore on demand fifteen thousand dollars in united states bonds which had been entrusted to him for safe keeping a warrant had been issued for mr mailing's arrest but at last accounts the officers had been unable to find him miss elserly immediately went into the closest retirement and even girls whom she had robbed of prospective beaux felt sorry for her people began to suggest that there might have been a chance for brown after all if he had stayed at home instead of rushing off to the west to play missionary he owned more property in his own right than the major had misplaced for other people and though some doubts were expressed as to miss elserly's fitness for the position of a minister's wife the matter was no less interesting as a subject for conversation the excellence of the chance which both brown and miss elserly had lost seemed even greater when it became noised abroad that brown had written to some real estate agents in the village that as he might want to go into business in the west to sell for him for cash a valuable farm which his father had left him as for the business which mr brown proposed entering the reader may form his own opinions from a little conversation here and after recorded as hubert brown trying to drown thought and do good was wandering through a colorado town one evening he found himself face to face with major mailing the major looked seedy and some years older than he did a month before but his pluck was unchanged seeing that an interview could not be avoided he assumed an independent air and exclaimed why brown what did you do that you had to come west nothing said the student flushing a little except be useless i thought said the major quickly with a desperate but sickly attempt at pleasantry that you had gone in for florence again she's worth all your lost sheep of the house of israel i don't make love to women who love other men replied brown don't please brown said the major turning manly in a moment i feel worse about her than about all my creditors or those infernal bonds i got into the snarl before i knew her that's the only way i can quiet my conscience of course the matter is all up now i wrote her as good an apology as i could and a release she'd have taken the latter without my giving it but no she wouldn't interrupted the student how do you know demanded the major with a suspicious glance which did not escape brown did you torment her by proposing again upon the top of her other troubles no said brown don't be insulting but i know that she keeps herself secluded and that her looks and spirits are dreadfully changed if she cared nothing for you she knows society would cheerfully forgive her if she were to show it i wish to satan that i hadn't met you then said the major i've taken solid comfort in the thought that most likely she was again the adored of all adorers and was forgetting me as she has so good a right to do major said brown bringing his hand down on the major's shoulder in a manner suggestive of a deputy sheriff you ought to go back to that girl and fail suggested the major thank you and allow me to say you're a devilish queer fellow for suggesting it is it part of your religion to forgive a successful rival it's part of my religion when i love to love the woman more than i love myself said brown with a face in which pain and earnestness strove for the mastery she loves you i loved her and want to see her happy the defaulter grasped the student's hand brown said he you're one of god's noblemen she told me so once but i didn't imagine then that i'd ever own up to it myself it can't be done though she can't marry a man in disgrace i can't ask a woman to marry me on nothing and besides there's the matter of those infernal bonds i can't clear that up and keep out of the sheriff's fingers i can said brown how asked the ex-broker with staring eyes i'll lend the money the major dropped brown's hand 
you heavenly lunatic said he i always did think religion made fools of men when they got too much of it then i could go back on the street again the boys would be glad to see me clear myself not meeting my engagements wouldn't be remembered against me but say borrow money from an old rival to make myself right with the girl he loved no excuse me i've got some sense of honour left you mean you love yourself more than you do her suggested brown i'll telegraph about the money and you write her in the meantime don't ruin her happiness for life by delay or trifling the major became a business man again brown said he i'll take your offer and whatever comes of it you'll have one friend you can swear to as long as i live you haven't the money with you no said brown but you shall have it in a fortnight i'll telegraph about it and go east and settle the business for you so you can come back without fear you're a trump but don't think hard of me money's never certain till you have it in hand i'll write and send my letter east by you when the matter's absolutely settled you can telegraph me and mail her my letter i'd expect to be shot if i made such a proposal to any other rival but you're not a man you're a saint confound you all the sermons i ever heard hadn't as much real goodness in them as i've heard the last ten minutes but twould be awful for me to write and then have the thing slip up brown admitted the justice of the major's plan and took the major to his own hotel to keep him from bad company during the whole evening the major talked about business but when after a night of sound sleep the student awoke he found the major pacing his room with a very pale face and heard him declare that he had not slept a wink brown pitied the major in his nervous condition and did what he could to alleviate it he talked to him of florence elserly of whom he seemed never to tire of talking he spoke to him of his own work and hopes he tried to picture to the major the happy future which was awaiting him but still the major was unquiet and absent-minded brown called in a physician to whom he said his friend was suffering from severe mental depression brought on by causes now removed but the doctor's prescriptions failed to have any effect finally when brown was to start for the east the major paler and thinner than ever handed him a letter addressed to miss elserly brown said the major i believe you won't lose any money by your goodness i can make money when i am not reckless and i'll make it my duty to be careful until you are paid the rest i can't pay but i'm going to try to be as good a man as you are that's the sort of compensation that'll please such an unearthly fellow best i guess when hubert brown reached blayton he closed with the best offer that had been made for his farm though the offer itself was one which made the natives declare that hubert brown had taken leave of his senses then he settled with the loser of the bonds saw one or two of the major's business acquaintances and prepared the way for the major's return then he telegraphed the major himself lastly he dressed himself with care and called upon miss elserly before sending up his card he pencilled upon it avec nouvelle allure which words the servant scanned with burning curiosity but of which she could remember but one when she tried to repeat them to the grocer's young man and this one she pronounced a rick as was natural enough in a lady of her nationality this much of the message was speedily circulated through the town and caused at least one curious person to journey to a great library in the city in quest of a celtic dictionary as for the recipient of the card she met her old lover with a face made more than beautiful by the conflicting emotions which manifested themselves in it the interview was short mr brown said he had accidentally met the major and had successfully acted as his agent in relieving him from his embarrassments he had the pleasure of delivering a letter from the major and hoped it might make miss elserly as happy to receive it as it made him to present it miss elserly expressed her thanks and then mr brown said pardon a bit of egotism and reference to an unpleasant subject miss elserly once i told you that i loved you 
in this matter of the majors i have been prompted solely by a sincere desire for your happiness and by acting in this spirit i have entirely taken the pain out of my old wound mayn't i therefore as the major's most sincere well-wisher enjoy once more your friendship miss elserly smiled sweetly and extended her hand and hubert brown went home a very happy man yet when he called again several evenings later he was not as happy as he had hoped to be in miss elserly's society for the lady herself though courteous and cordial seemed somewhat embarrassed and distrait and interrupted the young man on several occasions when he spoke in commendation of some good quality of the major's again he called and again the same strange embarrassment though less in degree manifested itself finally it disappeared altogether and miss elserly began to recover her health and spirits even then she did not exhibit as tender an interest in the major as the student had hoped she would do but as the major's truest friend he continued to sound his praises and to pay miss elserly in the major's stead every kind of attention he could devise finally he learned that the major was in the city and he hastened to inform miss elserly lest perhaps she had not heard so soon the lady received the announcement with an exquisite blush and downcast eyes though she admitted that the major had himself apprised her of his safe arrival on this particular evening the lady seemed to mr brown to be personally more charming than ever yet on the other hand the old embarrassment was so painfully evident that mr brown made an early departure arrived at home he found a letter from the major which read as follows my dear old fellow from the day on which i met you in colorado i've been trying to live after your pattern how i succeeded on the third day you may guess from enclosed which is a copy of a letter i sent to florence by you i've only just got her permission to send it to you though i've teased her once a week on the subject god bless you old fellow don't worry on my account for i'm really happy yours truly mailing with wondering eyes hubert brown read the enclosure which read as follows miss elserly three days ago while a fugitive from justice yet honestly loving you more than i ever loved any other being i met hubert brown he has cared for me as if i was his dearest friend he is going to make good my financial deficiencies and restore me to respectability he cannot have done this out of love for me for he knows nothing of me but that which should make him hate me on both personal and moral grounds he says he did it because he loved you and because he wants to see you happy miss elserly such love cannot be a thing of the past only and it is so great that in comparison with it the best love that i have ever given you seems beneath your notice he is begging me to go back for your sake he is constantly talking to me about you in a tone and with a look that shows how strong is the feeling he is sacrificing out of sincere regard for you miss elserly i never imagined the angels loving as purely and strongly as he does he tells me you still retain some regard for me the mere thought is so great a comfort that i cannot bear to reason seriously about it yet if any such feelings exist i must earnestly beg of you out of the sincere and faithful affection i have had for you to give up all thought of me forever and give yourself entirely to that most incomparable lover hubert brown forgive my intrusion and advice i give it because the remembrance of our late relations will assure you of the honesty and earnestness of my meaning i excuse myself by the thought that to try to put into such noble keeping the dearest treasure that i ever possessed is a duty which justifies my departure from any conventional rule i am miss elserly as ever your worshipper more than this i cannot dare to think of being after my own fall and the overpowering sense i have of the superior worth of another god bless you andrew mailing 
mr brown hastily laid the letter aside and again called upon miss elserly again she met him with many signs of the embarrassment whose cause he now understood so well yet as he was about to deliver an awkward apology a single look from under miss elserly's eyebrows only a glance but as searching and eloquent as it was swift stopped his tongue he took miss elserly's hand in his own and stammered i came to plead for the major and i shan't listen to you said she raising her eyes with so tender a light in them that hubert brown immediately hid the eyes themselves in his heart lest the light should be lost End of story thirty four